Welcome to Whores Talk Horror. We're not really whores. We just like wordplay. Hello and welcome to Horse Talk Horror. I'm, sh- wait, was that right? Yeah. <laughs> I know, wait, what are we doing? What are we talking wait, about? Wait, what is this podcast called again? Hello, welcome to Horse Talk Horror. I'm Sharon. And I'm Melinda. And we have had a few weeks off from recording, so we might not be uh, <laughs> completely on our game. I've been sick with the flu for the last couple of weeks and needed time off work and time off from recording. Um, but I did have a lot of time to binge true crime. So silver I, lining. I wasn't sick, um, at least with the flu, but uh, sick of <laughs> everything else. Sick of life. Sick of life. But uh, I enjoyed binging a few things myself. So in a way, thank you, Sharon, for that little break. <laughs> And uh, before we get on to the main topic today, which is serial killers who were either influenced by or influenced Hollywood movies, uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that we've been watching. Um, Mindy, I know you don't watch You, but I was able to finish uh, season two of You, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about it since you don't watch it and you also kind of refuse to watch it uh, due to some of the controversies surrounding the show. Well, I gave the first episode a, like a, a good half hour and I just, I couldn't do it just because I was too creeped out. And I By get the character or by? The, uh, all of it. But yeah, mm. the character and, and I real I get what they're trying to do and I get the point of the show. I just don't know that that's something that I, that's for me right now. But yeah. I, is, I'm happy that you enjoy it. And how, how did you enjoy season two? It was good. I think I liked um, season one a little bit better season two was still good but it did kind of like really veer off the rails on like the whole believability train Mm -hmm. um it kind of I don't know it I'm not gonna give away any spoilers for those people who have not seen it but it just got a little too ridiculous towards the end um and they did suggest that there's going to be a season three so I guess we'll see where it goes from there but I don't know. I, I think it's a fun show to watch. Um, and again, I, I haven't even seen it, so no spoilers. But I, because I'm curious, I did like look up articles about it and about season two. And I will say that like reading what, what bits I, I read about what's happening or what happened in season two, I mm-hmm. was kind of like, huh? Like, so I, I'm not surprised to hear you say that it sounds like it might be dextering a little bit and not in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, honestly, I think you could probably watch season two without really seeing season one because they they do a ton of like flashbacks to season one and they keep you up to date on the storyline. So you could probably just start there if you wanted to check it out. You were the one that told me about all the controversies surrounding the show, which I was completely unaware of. If you're unaware of the controversy surrounding the show, a lot of people think the show is problematic because it may lead some women, especially very young women and girls, to think that it's okay for men to be controlling and obsessive and might confuse obsession and control with love or romance. And we've talked about maybe doing like a future episode uh, about covering this topic and not just with like this show, but other other shows that um, possibly portray... Uh, similar similar storylines with you know m- attractive men being held to different standards well, <laughs> when it comes to uh the way they treat women yeah and it's the whole like but he does it because he loves me thing which is like well but he doesn't kill you because he loves you you know what i mean like it, yeah it, it that is this is a discussion for another time but i will say if anybody <laughs> wants a nice little chuckle um Sharon, I think you, I sent you the article, but um, if you look on Twitter, what's the, is it Penn Bagley? Is that the actor's name? Penn Badgley. Badgley. Thank you. Say, I don't know. Um, he, his people were like tweeting to him about how much they love his character and his responses were hilarious and amazing. Like he was basically like one woman wrote like, kidnap me. And he just responded, thanks, no, or something <laughs> like that. And then somebody else was like, oh my God, I love him. And he was like, well, he's a serial killer. And he does this, this. like he, he was like bring it, keeping it real, but in a really funny, dry, like to the point manner. So it's worth looking up on Twitter to laugh. I feel like. Yeah. I was amused. <laughs> I think he's a little shocked at some of the reactions to his character, but. Anyways, um, so I also watched uh, 
Killer Inside, The Mind of Aaron Hernandez, which is on Netflix. Uh, I did think it was good. And I really knew like very, very little about the story because I don't follow sports at all anymore because I don't really have time to. But I did enjoy it and found it interesting. And I did like the whole um, the fact that it brings up the whole nature versus nurture argument. And also you add the other layer of him experiencing so many different head injuries, playing football and having uh, CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy and how that could impact someone's actions if they already have pre-existing psychological issues. Um, I also watched the I watched part of one Aaron Hernandez documentary that I was saying before we started recording, I think was on that channel Reels and that's R-E-E-L-Z. Um, and it was a two-parter. It was really long, and I only really saw the first half. But then I did watch the Netflix one, which I I like the Netflix doc a lot better. And this is a totally petty comment that I I just have to make. But they interviewed his college girlfriend, and at least in the first documentary I saw, I don't remember if she alluded to this in the Netflix one. But like they were talking about how he was playing for Florida, and then like you know the NFL draft came up, and then when he got drafted. Like they basically parted ways and she made a comment in the one documentary I I watched that was kind of like, well, you know, I knew he was going to be going off to the NFL and I didn't want to be an NFL wife. And I just remember being like, is she trying to throw shade at like the woman who was his fiance? Because that's kind of a bitchy comment because he left her to go back to his fiance, I guess, Mm -hmm. and the mother, his his baby mama but I just I I thought that was kind of funny that like I don't know possibly but I honestly wouldn't want to be an NFL wife either no I wouldn't at all for sure especially after watching that yeah I did not tell you I was watching this uh Uh oh but I've binged all available episodes of The Outsider and I fucking love it and usually when Mindy tells me, like, oh, my God, you got to watch this. You're going to love it. There is, like, a 95% chance I'm not going to love it. That's not totally true. <laughs> or at least I'm not going to love it as much as Mindy loves it. It's good, though, isn't it? And she usually hypes things up so much that I'm, like, kind of, like, prepared to, like, almost out of spite not like it. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend tell me once, like, Jesus, you'll, because I'll do the same thing to, like, my friend Andy, and he'll be like, you'll fight me on everything, and then you'll finally watch it, and then you, like, want to start a fan club for it. And, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm up to date now with The Outsider, too, so, and my mom is, too, and, like, we call each other weekly, and she's like, I can't take it. I have to see what's going to happen next. But it's good shit, right? It's, it's really good. Really, like, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil it and it's complicated to talk about but i'm i was freaking out oh like this last week i love it Can't i think i need more. to read the book is it just one book or i think it's is just it a one series book, but okay. the character um oh gosh what's her name the private detective oh yes yes um, uh the one that play is played by uh cynthia arrivo yes she she's amazing that character um, a lot of his books have characters that kind of interweave into like a world of their own. Mm-hmm. And she, I guess, is one of those characters. She's in multiple books of his. Okay. Spencer and I watched the most recent episode the other night and oh. I was like, she's kind of like a female Dale Cooper. Yeah. So Yeah, totally. She's my favorite so far. And we just watched her. Um, she plays Harriet Tubman in yes. the movie Harriet. And she's incredible in that too. So she definitely has like a ton of range. She's a she's an amazing actress um but yeah her character in this is just so fascinating to me I just I just love everything about her character agreed um so finally then um we both binged the new uh Amazon Ted Bundy documentary Falling for a Killer I mean there's really not like a ton of spoilers everyone pretty much knows (laughs) the story of Ted Bundy spoiler alert he did it he did it (laughs) He was guilty. So at first I was kind of like, all right, you know, here we go. Elizabeth Kendall and her daughter Molly, who was Elizabeth Kendall, it was Ted Bundy's girlfriend and her young daughter Molly. They're being interviewed for a majority of the special. And at first I'm like, they're humanizing Bundy. And here's another like, let's see how charming this man is and make you forget what a monster he is. And then suddenly 
I realized that they only started the documentary like that just to show kind of how they fell for his charms and how they really did love him and how they were actually just manipulated by him like all of his other victims. Or many other women who have been abused or, you know, in horrible relationships that they couldn't get out of or didn't want to get out of. Yeah, so they they kind of had to show that yeah. side of him to introduce the story and then quickly it goes to being a documentary about uh the victims and giving them a voice and allowing them to be something more than just a number one of you know ted bundy's 20 or 30 or more victims right. and it's basically the first documentary that i've seen about bundy that actually interviews his victims families and friends and they show videos and home movies of these women when they were little and throughout their short lives and it really reminds you that however charming and nice bundy was on the surface it was all a lie and that basically he destroyed not only the lives of his victims but every single other person who knew and loved these women and there's actually hundreds of victims that he left behind and even his younger brother who they showed living in this tiny little trailer with his cat that was so heartbreaking like yeah I think I texted as I started watching it I think I texted Sharon like 20 minutes into the first episode and was like oh my god this is the Ted Bundy documentary I've been waiting for because I agree like I don't need another rehash of like what he did to these women Mm -hmm. I'd never heard from some of their family members or I'd never seen his brother really interviewed the other thing that really really struck me and resonated with me is that it was from the women's perspective for a change but they also kind of showed how the temperature of the country at that time and what was happening like you know women's lib was just getting started and not a lot of people were down with that Mm -hmm. even still today really I mean, Sharon had her her coverage on nature versus nurture taught us, you know, quite a bit. So I think that like any time Ted Bundy would have been born, he still was a psycho and would have done stuff. Women weren't really people at that in that era. And their cries for help went disregarded. And I think that had things been differently, they would have caught him way sooner. One one before we move on to yeah. our topic of the day, one thing that I thought was like totally shocking was when um, Susan Rancourt went missing and they had the Boy Scouts looking for her body. I was like, how who is like, OK, let's have all these young boys go out and search for a dead body. Like, does that still happen? I mean, what badge do you get? I was just, I, that's why I was just, that's why I paused because I was just thinking, is that for your like dead body finding badge or something? I can't think of. Anyways. Boy, Scout, Boy Scouts were different back then. I Were you ever a Boy Scout? No way. <laughs> oh, it's the, the corpse finding badge. That's Before, the oh. one that they were trying to get. Oh, that's a very coveted badge. <laughs> it just looks like the, uh, the white tape or the, like, yeah, the chalk like outline. An outline. Yeah. So on to the topic of the day. So Minnie and I each chose to uh, research and write about a killer that we previously mentioned briefly in um, past episodes. My killer was actually inspired by Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street. And Mindy, your killer, the movie Black Christmas is loosely based on this person that you're going to be discussing? He was slightly, in, I think he inspired the killer in Black Christmas. Um, but I can I can talk more about that if you'd like. Yes. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll go first. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about Wayne Bowden, the vampire killer of Montreal. I'm not sure if I ever mentioned this ever, but one of my favorite horror movies is the 1974 film Black Christmas, directed by Bob Clark and written by Roy Moore. This is completely brand new news to me. I've never heard you mention Black Christmas ever. I literally wrote in my notes, pause for Sharon's comment. (laughs) (laughs) Um, For as much as I blab about this movie all the time, it occurred to me that I've never really looked into the inspiration for the film. Um, Aside from writer uh, Roy Moore's obvious take on the 
infamous urban legend, the babysitter and the man upstairs, which is, you know, the one the have you checked the children? He's calling from inside the house, that that story. Um, I've always read that Bob Clark claimed that he and Moore had no inspiration for the concept of Black Christmas, that the idea was completely original, with one exception. IMDb sums it up pretty well. Bob Clark, in a Q&A, said that he had no inspiration for the film's concept and that it was a completely original idea for him and Roy Moore. The only thing in- that inspired the film was the actual series of murders that occurred in Montreal. And I was like, wait, Black Christmas is a true crime connection? That was an internet rabbit hole? Just calling my name, really. So before I go any further, I just want to uh, cite some of the sources I used for the info bomb I'm about to drop on y'all. All of this content was taken from the following sources. Um, IMDb's Black Christmas page, Wikipedia's entry on the babysitter and the man upstairs urban legend, um, an article from Re- Refinery21 written by Rachel Page uh, called Black Christmas is based on an urban legend and true story. Entries on murderpedia.org and two podcasts um the first being the dark poutine podcast true crime and dark history the episode is called wayne bowden the vampire rapist um and then episode 70 from the podcast big if true Um, both podcasts are available on whatever service of your choice that you like to use so i encourage you to check it out if you're interested um And so now, without further ado, allow me to present the story of Wayne Bowden, the vampire killer of Montreal, an inspiration, at least in part, for the horror classic Black Christmas. Hold on to your butts. Uh, Wayne Clifford Bowden was born on New Year's Day, 1948. He was born in Dundas, Ontario. I've heard that pronounced a few different ways, like, but I think it's Dundas, so we're going to go with that. His family was middle class. Uh, His father was a factory worker. His mother was uneducated, but she was a full-time stay-at-home mom and strict as hell, uh, known for keeping a a very tightly run household. All chores, which were plentiful, uh, required timely completion and had to be done to mom's satisfaction. Should anything not meet mom's high standards, there would be hell to pay. Uh, Some reports claim Wayne was not allowed in the living room, kitchen, or family room. He was only allowed access to the bathroom and his bedroom. Sounds like how I run the household with Spencer. I wasn't going to say anything. (laughs) I'm having flashbacks. I wasn't going to say anything. Just kidding. Um, I'm, to a, say, I'm a bit of a neat freak, <laughs> for those who don't know. Uh, well, I have a feeling that Wayne's mom might have... Pu- pushed the limits just a little yeah, bit more. a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> but I've never seen our living room or kitchen or dining room. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. No comment. Um, to say that Wayne's home was not a loving one is an understatement. Uh, both of his parents treated him coldly and never showed affection towards Wayne or each other. Um, He was an only child, and he showed no early signs of mental instability, like the usual, like, you know, animal torture or the, oh, shit, he's crazy childhood signs. In fact, he excelled in school and was remembered by his grade school teachers as helpful and a bright student, though he was often picked on by his classmates for being a teacher's pet. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that Wayne probably had some mommy issues uh, growing up in a home filled with rules, chores, and confinement instead of love and parental support. He, Whenever his teachers would ask about his mother, uh, even in grade school, Wayne would say that she had passed away, that she was dead. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I got in fights with my mom growing up, and I was a raging bitch in junior high, but damn, like that's pretty you, you never hateful to be like she's that your dead. Mom was dead yeah yeah by the time he got to high school Wayne had grown into actually a pretty good looking dude he played high school football um, but unfortunately he was extremely extremely shy which and that kept him from dating or even approaching girls did he have any head injuries due to uh, playing football <laughs> Not that not that I could find, um, but he only played in high school okay. and briefly, so I doubt it. 
But you never know, maybe. After high school, Wayne stayed local for a bit. Uh, he tried finding work as a salesman and actually worked for a brief time as a fashion model. Um, but it was high time to get out of Dundas. And so around age 19 or 20, Wayne moved to Montreal, Quebec, uh, with the intention of starting a career as a traveling salesman, which, cool, but like if you're shy, that's a tough job. But okay. What year was this? This was uh, like 67, 68 ish. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Tra- traveling salesman, that was more of a thing back then. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he moved to Montreal because it was happening and he thought, you know, he wanted to be in the city and far the fuck away from his parents. Um, and Wayne lived uh, in a cozy apartment in like the center of town. In the fall of 1969, uh, Wayne was living down the street from a woman named Shirley Audette. Uh, Many sources described Shirley as having been a nervous person, with some mentions that she possibly had been hospitalized the year before for, quote, unspecified mental issues. Uh, However, in late September, early October of 1969, uh, Shirley was living with her boyfriend, Kenneth, when she discovered she was pregnant. So now I'm not sure if this is like late 60s, early 70s rumor bullshit, but a lot of the reports, in fact, most of the reports I came across about Shirley um, specifically mentioned that she was rumored to be promiscuous. And even her live-in boyfriend doubted whether or not he was the father of her baby. Uh, She swore he was, but to me, it sounds like Shirley was just prone to anxiety, liked company, especially since her boyfriend actually worked the night shift at his job, often leaving her home alone in the evenings. But whatever, victim blaming. Yeah, I was going to say back then, I I don't think women had to do much to be considered promiscuous. Right, exactly. Um, So on October 2nd, 1969, around 3 a.m., Shirley's boyfriend, Ken, was working his night shift and she called him to check in. Uh, She said she was nervous to be home alone, but that she'd met a handsome man whom she'd been chatting with outside. Uh, Returning home mid-morning on later, I guess, in the morning on October 2nd, uh, Ken came home and could not find Shirley anywhere. Initially, (laughs) He assumed she had run off with the handsome stranger she'd mentioned in her 3 a.m. check-in phone call, but then started to get worried as the day wore on. The next day, October 3rd, the their apartment building's maintenance man found Shirley dead near the back alleyway of her apartment complex, lying on her back, the top half of her body partly sitting up against a fire escape ladder, and her facial expression wide-eyed and smiling in rigor mortis. Which, I'm sorry, how fucking scary would that be to, like, find a dead body smiling at you? Mm -hmm. The police noted that she was fully clothed, except for her shoes, which were found later in the apartment courtyard. She showed no signs of a struggle. She had no bruises or even skin or particles under her fingernails, though she had been raped and strangled. Uh, The only marks on her, which were determined to have been administered while she was alive, were savage bite marks on her breasts. And not love bites, but break the skin vicious bite marks. Uh, The bites were not mentioned to the public, uh, kept as, quote, hold back evidence. So, skip a month or so to uh, November 23rd, Marielle Archambault uh, was a 20-year-old cute girl who loved to be social. She enjoyed her job as a jewelry clerk in downtown Montreal, liked to go out and party at night. Um, November 23rd during the day, she came into work gushing to her coworkers about a man named, quote, Bill she'd met the night before, who was dreamy and was and was going to take her out that evening. Uh, she left work at closing time with a young man who she claimed was Bill, though he waited out on the street for her and didn't come inside the shop. Her coworkers remarked that she seemed happy and entranced by the man. Uh, when Archambault did not report for work the following morning, her employer went to check on her in her apartment to see if she was ill. Together with her landlady, they discovered Archambault to be fully clad on her couch The room was tidy, but Marielle's pantyhose and bra were ripped. She'd been raped, and there were bite marks on her breasts. The rest of the apartment appeared disheveled and torn up. Again, no signs of struggle or a break-in, and her body appeared posed with a pillow placed under her feet. 
Uh, the police were able to find a crumpled photograph amid the wreckage of Archambault's apartment, uh, which was readily identified as the mysterious Bill by her co-workers. However, despite this apparent break, the police were not successful in connecting the photograph to any known suspect, even though a police sketch based on the picture was distributed for publication in the newspapers. Uh, Wikipedia says that the photo turned out to be uh, Marielle's dead father, though I also heard that he was just a friend of hers and his name was not Bill. Either way, balls, stalemate. On to, uh, we go through Christmas and now it's January 1970. Uh, Jean Wei, a 24-year-old uh, school teacher, moved to Montreal from New Finland looking for mo- a more exciting life. On uh, January 16th, 1970, she spent the day shopping and noticed that she'd seen the same man in a few different stores. Whenever she tried to make eye contact, the guy would look away or even hide behind clothes racks. Panicked, Jean entered a photo studio and told the owner she was being followed and asked if she could exit through the back. The owner said sure, let Jean out through the back exit into the alley, and came back to peer out the front windows, but saw nothing odd or out of place. Later that evening, Way's boyfriend, Brian Caulfield, came to pick her up for a scheduled date at her apartment on Lincoln Street in downtown Montreal. When Way did not answer the door, he decided to come back a little bit later, but upon returning found the door to be unlocked. Uh, Caulfield found Way's naked body on the bed her, with her breasts undamaged. Multiple sources I found speculate that Bowden was most likely in Way's apartment when Caulfield was knocking on the door earlier that evening. Uh, an autopsy conducted by Dr. Jean-Paul Valcourt, possibly I said that right, uh, found two small fibers under the fingernails of her left hand, indicating, contrary to prior belief, that Way had indeed struggled against her assailant. After Way's death, the resulting publicity from the murders caused a brief mass hysteria in Montreal, although this disappeared as Bowden had fled the city and the murders stopped. So at this time, was there any sort of... Um hint other than the two women had their breasts bitten that this might be like a serial rapist murderer on the loose were they making the connection they were thinking that um but you know late 60s early 70s there's not the technology for a lot of that stuff um and they were like i think i had mentioned that like the the biting thing was kind of kept from the public Mm -hmm. they distributed you know, publicly, like the sketch that was drawn up, and they they were getting the word out, so people. But the cops knew about the bites. Yes, the cops did. Yes, so yes. They they can make that connection. Yes, and yes. also it sounds like um, he kind of inherited some of his mom's OCD behaviors. Like the the bodies seemed very clean and tidy and like he redressed them after put a pillow under her feet yeah 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 he seems like he's got a little touch of the ocd as well yeah i i wonder why (laughs) so now we fast forward to uh calgary alberta early 1971 while on a friend's weekend outside calgary 33 year old high school teacher elizabeth ann porteous met a man who referred to himself as, you guessed it, Bill, while waiting for a friend in a bar. He started chatting her up, and the two exchanged numbers, saying maybe they could get together once they were back in Calgary. Bill, in air quotes, uh, left before Elizabeth's friend met her at the bar, and on the way back to Calgary, she gushed about the charming, handsome Bill and how attractive he was. And two weeks later, Elizabeth and Bill had their first date planned. She even went shopping with her friends for an outfit to wear on their date. On May 18th, 1971, when Elizabeth failed to show up for her work, her apartment manager was called, who found her body on the bedroom floor. As with Marielle Archambault, her apartment showed considerable signs of struggle and Elizabeth had been raped and strangled. Her breasts were likewise mutilated with bite marks. Amid the wreckage, however, the police recovered a broken cuff link under the victim's body. In their investigation of the murder, the police were able to find out from two of her colleagues that Elizabeth was seen at a stoplight riding in a blue Mercedes Benz on the night that she died. 
The car was reported as having a distinctive advertising bull-shaped decal in the rear window, which I feel like if you're going to try to be hidden, put a bull on your car. Um, A friend of the victim also informed the police that she had been recently dating a man named Bill, who was described as a flashy dresser with neat short hair. Uh, The following day, on May 19th, the blue Mercedes was spotted by a patrolman parked near the murder scene, actually. Uh, Bowden was arrested half an hour later as he went to his car. He told the police that he moved from Montreal the previous year and admitted that he had been dating Elizabeth and was with her on the night of her murder. When the broken cuff link was presented to him, he admitted its ownership. However, he insisted that Elizabeth was fine when he left that night. Uh, The police in Calgary were in possession of a copy of the photograph recovered from Archambault's apartment, and as Bowdoin resembled the man in the picture, they held him for suspicion in murdering Elizabeth. Police turned their attention to the marks on the victim's breasts. The police then contacted Gordon Swan, a local orthodontist, uh, to help prove that the marks on Elizabeth Porteous's breasts and neck were Bowden's bite marks with the intent to verify them as having been left by Bowden. As there was nothing in Canadian forensic literature on bite mark evidence at the time, Swan wrote to the FBI in the United States hoping for any information on the matter. He received a reply from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who directed him to England, where he met a man who had dealt with 20 or 30 cases regarding bite marks. Eventually, Swan was able to get the information he needed, and based on a cast made of Bowdoin's teeth, he managed to demonstrate 29 points of similarity between the bite marks in Elizabeth's body and Bowdoin's teeth. The evidence provided by Gordon Swan was sufficient for the jury of Bowdoin's trial to find him guilty for Elizabeth's murder, and subsequently he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Bowdoin was the first murderer to be convicted in Canada, though some claim in all of North America, the first to be convicted based on odontological evidence. Did I say that right, Sharon? Yes. Yes, awesome. Uh, Bowdoin then returned to Montreal to face trial, where he confessed to three murders, those of Shirley Audette, uh, Marielle Archambault, and Jean Way, and was sentenced to three additional life terms. Bowdoin was sent to the Kingston Penitentiary in Kingston, Ontario, where he began serving his sentence on February 16, 1972. Bowdoin was initially believed to be involved in the death of a Norma Villancourt, a 21-year-old student killed on July 23, 1968, though he denied his involvement. In 1994, a man named Raymond, I would say suave, but it's S-A-U-V-E, um, but he he was convicted for um, Norma's death and sentenced to 10 years in prison. So it, that was one person that Wayne didn't actually kill. But wait, there's more. So the seventies were a different time, uh, and in nineteen uh, 19- literally, yeah, <laughs> but in a lot of ways. And in nineteen seventy seven, five years into his life sentence, Bowden applied and was approved for an American Express card while in prison. What? A few years later, women now tw- couldn't even get their own credit cards until like seventy eight or something like that. I'm look Spencer actually looked that up. Well, apparently, and there's more. I'll there's more to this, so we'll get to that. But yeah, that was a thing that used to happen. Um, here's another thing that used to happen that's messed up. Uh, Twelve years into his sentence, so that brings us to 1984. Wayne was granted a day pass from prison, which allowed him to go out in public while accompanied by a social worker. And apparently, this was something that they would do in Canada. I, I have not researched to see if it was done elsewhere, but that's, I mean, this guy killed people. Why would you, whatever. 1974 is when women could get a credit card, by the way. Although that's in America. I don't know about uh, Canada, so I didn't look that up. Anyway. Still, that's besides the point. Well, it's fucked up. Anyway. The fact that a woman couldn't get her own credit card without a, a man's help in 1974, but this chump 
was able to apply for a credit card while being imprisoned for murder in what was that 1977 was it 77 yeah when he got yeah well, you, you know, there's all those credit card machines in prison. You got to get your <laughs> well, food and you got to buy your shiv. And Well, well, <laughs> hang on, though. Hang on. It gets better. And by better, I mean... Worse. Worse. I want to <laughs> hang my head. Um, so, yeah, Wayne in 1984 got a day pass from prison. So he went out on the town in Montreal and he was accompani- accompanied by a social worker. Um, he actually used his Amex to pay for lunch in the Contiki restaurant in downtown Montreal, after which he excused himself to use the restroom where he escaped through the bathroom window. He was recaptured several days later at a bar on a Mackey Street in downtown Montreal. Uh, the three prison guards who were supposed to be in charge of his day pass were disciplined. And American Express conducted an internal investigation to find out how a prisoner serving a life sentence for murder managed to get a credit card. <laughs> wah, wah. Um, Wayne Bowden died from skin cancer at Kingston General Hospital on March 27, 2006, after being confined in the hospital for six weeks. While he wasn't known to hide in attics of sorority houses and make dirty phone calls, a number of the details in his story have me convinced that he was, if nothing else, at least the inspiration or model for the molding of the character for in Black Christmas, the murderer, the killer. It sounds like they both had mommy issues. For sure. As much as I love this movie, the realization just hit me last night that I don't even own it, actually. I have like some rando copy that was ripped from a DVD about 10 years ago. So I ordered the 40th anniversary collector's edition Blu-ray, which apparently has a lot of like uh, interviews and special features and stuff. So I'm eager to see if any direct mention of Bowdoin is made by, you know, Bob Clark or Roy Moore in the gajillion special features this edition apparently has. Um, In the meantime, allow me to speculate on how I think or or what I think uh, they drew inspiration from to create the killer in Black Mm -hmm. Christmas. The obvious one, of course, is the name Bill. Uh, Bowdoin used the, the name to confuse cops and hide his identity. Of course, Billy is the name of the killer in Black Christmas. Whether or not it's his given name is really not the point. I still get creeped out every time he says it in the calls. Um, Both killers on screen and off clearly have issues with women, uh, what with the constant murdering of them and all. Uh, While Bowdoin kept small tokens of his victims like buttons or trinkets, uh, movie Billy, as I like to call him, stepped it up a notch, collecting the victims themselves, keeping them in the attic, you know. Based on the film's ending, he kind of got away with it. Maybe, maybe not. Um, from what we can gather of Billy's calls to the sorority house in the in the film Black Christmas, it totally sounds like he's reenacting shouting matches, punishments, torture, or worse. At least I get mm-hmm. that. Um, given what we know about Wayne's relationship with his parents, particularly his mother, I think it's safe to say that, yes, dude had some mommy issues and... I mean, you know, what with telling his grade school teachers his mother was dead and all. That's probably safe to say. Both Billies clearly lack an understanding of healthy human interaction, to put it lightly. It's known that Wayne was raised in a loveless home, that he hated his parents, but especially his mother, and was unable to connect with other human beings outside the family due to crippling shyness. It's not hard for me to imagine that the combo of all those dysfunctions fostered anger, resentment, and hatred, particularly towards women. Uh, If I had to write my own backstory for the movie version of Billy, Wayne's would definitely fit the criteria for batshit waiting to happen. Um, I I did hear that Bob Clark apparently wrote and built out a whole backstory for Killer Billy, um, and I'm hoping that maybe this new Blu-ray the Amazon fairy is going to bring me will will have something about that in the special features. I mean, obviously, Bowden was disturbed. I've not found much on extended family history, so I'm curious to know if any mental illness ran in his family, like aside from clearly the issues his parents had. Uh, but if Sharon's coverage on Nature versus Nurture taught us anything, Surviving a shitty childhood does not necessarily a serial killer make. 
I think it's interesting that by all accounts, he was a good student and never displayed any of the usual warning signs of a sociopath as a child. It's possible he learned to bury his emotions early so that his inner turmoil grew and grew until the pressure just became too much and he cracked. But again, I'm totally speculating here. I just think personally something deep down wasn't right with Wayne. And unfortunately, his environment early on really didn't help things all that much. Uh, I mean, he's, even still, he had, he had the urge to stalk, kill, and the foresight to take steps that would elude authorities. Had he been raised in the most loving, caring environment ever, no doubt he still would have ended up murdering women, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, so in closing, here's just a few fun extra facts. Um, Wayne Bowden was the first criminal in both Canada and North America to be convicted based on Forensic odontology. There you go. His <laughs> conviction preceded that of another infamous psycho who was also convicted on that same type of evidence. I'm going to say Ted Bundy. Hey, and actually speaking of Ted Bundy, fun fact, uh, NBC scheduled Black Christmas for its primetime network debut on January 28th, 1978 under the title Stranger in the House. On January 15th, 1978, Two female students at Florida State University were murdered by an assailant who broke into the sorority house where they lived. Three other young women in the immediate vicinity were attacked and assaulted. NBC received numerous pleas from locals to pull the movie from broadcast in light of the crimes. And after first stating that they would offer local affiliates an alternative movie to broadcast, they decided to just pull the plug on the movie altogether. Instead, the film Doc Savage, Man of Bronze was shown. Uh, NBC instead ran Stranger in the House as a late night movie on May 14th of the same year. The perpetrator of the crimes at Florida State University was later identified as... I'm going to say Theodore Bundy. That's correct. That's actually really funny that you mentioned that because I was thinking of a lot of similarities between Wayne Bowden and Ted Bundy while you're talking about his, you know, his crimes and wondering... If by chance Ted Bundy researched him or knew about him, and maybe that's kind of where he got some of the ideas, like I'm uh, privileged enough to to get all this time to study law and libraries and have yeah. uh, basically unattended supervision, which allowed him to escape and have like this kind of like buddy buddy relationship with some of the guards. That it just yeah. Yeah, Ugh, there's was, a lot of comparisons that I was I was making in my head when you were discussing his story. And like the part about like them wanting to air the movie around the Florida uh, State University killings. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that until like last night. And I was like, OK, yeah, that's just like the final nail. Like there's total, total connections. The urban legend, the babysitter and the man upstairs. Apparently, that urban legend originated in the early 1960s, but there's obviously tons of different versions of it. Um, Some of them still creep me out, though, when I come across them. I just wanted to mention, too, uh, apparently in some creepy pasta versions, the babysitter is increasingly unnerved by what she assumes is a hideous life-size statue of a clown in the room. When the parents call to check on the children, the babysitter complains that the statue or cl- complains about the statue and asks if she can cover it up with a sheet or move it from the room. The confused parents reply they don't have a clown statue. The baby is then attacked by the clown, which turned out to be a murderer in disguise. Ew. But this was, I never, I want to Wait, know, who the hell would have a life-size clown statue in the first place? That's why the babysitter was creeped out. Honestly, oh, right. I've heard a similar creepypasta, but it's a... Um, it's a like a life size Santa Claus, or maybe it's actually a oh, short. Oh no, no, that we saw that in a short. Oh yeah. yes, it was actually a short film. Yeah, 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 a uh, short was, horror. Yeah, there which a, might have been called All Through the House. Shut up. Or something similar. Something similar. Yeah, but, but you're right. It was like a life size uh, Santa statue. Yes, which or turned so out to be thought. yeah. Which why would you want a life size? Well, exactly. Like anything. It w- was not a real statue. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. Spoilers. And then I I didn't realize this. I know I didn't have this book, but I guess another iteration of the story has the children 
uh, with the babysitter watching television, and then the prowler starts phoning them, saying he'll be with them in a certain amount of time. Then after they get the news that the calls are coming from inside the house, they hear a door upstairs opening, and then the sound of footsteps heading towards the room where they are. And this version apparently was in one of the volumes of Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, Hmm. which... I don't remember reading. I know we read the shit out of those books when we were kids. I don't remember ever coming across that one, but hey. And now finally, and I will shut up about Black Christmas. It actually holds the honor of being one of the first mainstream films with a large release that contained the word cunt. That, I will probably give it that. (laughs) Uh, Although the word was cut from the UK premiere of the film. So we got to hear cunt and which is kind of funny because don't they use cunt like most people use the word fuck in the UK? Maybe, Isn't that a, a fairly common maybe not in the seventies word over there? Uh, yeah, it, it, mo- more so Australia, but a bit in the UK too. Yeah, they definitely use it more than we do here. But in the seventies, did they? I'm sure. I'm sure all of a on sudden, tele- like one day, it, well, maybe not on television, but I want to say it's a fairly a standard um, slang term. I mean, I could totally be wrong, but I I feel like... Well, they didn't want no cunts in the UK in 74. (laughs) But uh, in America, it was shown with the word in USA, USA. Yeah, I I just feel like when I've watched British movies and television shows that I've heard the word cunt just thrown around willy-nilly like it's nothing yeah of all the things that happened in that movie i found i thought that that was like the weirdest thing and most random thing to like cut that is the story of wayne bowden the vampire killer aka billy's inspiration from black christmas probably (laughs) all right well thank you mindy good job thank you that is yeah i I, I don't see so, a ton of comparisons between Billy the Killer, but there's, yeah, definitely. There's little things that, yeah. Definitely yeah. enough, but very interesting because, yeah, I, I didn't know anything about about this uh, this guy. Um, that's actually why I'm really excited to dive into the special features on that Blu-ray because I actually had a hard time finding, like, any direct quotes or, or stuff that like, were, like, Roy Moore or Bob Clark like legit was like oh we heard about this dude and that kind of spawned this idea so I it was all reportedly it was inspired by blah 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 and so yeah while I could draw parallels I'm really I'm dying I'll, I might have to do a follow-up and report back after I watch okay. all the special features yeah I might have to buy my own copy of that it was on Amazon not super expensive just saying any hoosie Sharon what are you going to talk about today All right, so I'm going to be discussing Daniel Gonzalez, a.k.a. the Freddy Krueger killer and also the Mummy's Boy killer. Uh, There is also um, another serial killer in New Zealand known as the Mummy's Boy killer as well. Uh, But this is the British spree killer who is responsible for the deaths of four people, and he also injured two others over a bloody two-day rampage in September of 2004 Whoa. in London and Sussex. I think it's worth saying that Sharon and I loved Freddy Krueger movies when we were little, and I didn't know. I didn't, I don't. I know nothing about this story. Well, I will say that the the comparisons between Freddy Krueger and Daniel Gonzalez. Also, it's kind of a stretch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, his his killings were not very reminiscent of. Freddy Krueger he just happened to like Freddy Krueger in horror movies which we will get into um also I did say earlier that I think he was a serial killer oh sure um not a serial killer spree killer obviously there's differences but he did kill multiple people uh so the sources that I used are Wikipedia Murderpedia, and also an article on the Criminal Code website titled Daniel Gonzalez, The Cry for Help That Nobody Heard by Dr. Clarissa Cole. Hmm. So let's start with his early life. Daniel Gonzalez was born June 21st, 1980, and lived in Woking, Surrey, a large town in northwest Surrey, England, about 30 miles outside of London. His mother, Leslie Savage, was English and his father was Spanish. 
His parents separated in 1986 when he was six years old. He went to Gordon School, a privately run school in West End, Woking. He was described as, quote, dark and handsome. Mm. He was also known to be a talented actor, a chess champion, and a good student. However, people also refer to Gonzalez as a, quote, dark and troubled boy. Sources say he never had a girlfriend, he did not have any friends, and he never had a job. While still in school, he had begun talking to himself and would laugh out loud for no apparent reason. His favorite pastime was to watch horror films. Around the age of 17, his parents became so worried about him that they decided to take him to a psychologist. Because of his psychological problems, he was treated by a team of mental health specialists. Eventually, he was expelled from secondary school for drawing offensive cartoons and repeatedly placing pins on students' seats. Gonzalez began using drugs, which he purchased on the street. His life began to degrade quickly, and he engaged in minor assaults, shoplifting, and vandalism like window breaking. For approximately six months, between 1998 and 1999, so around the ages of 18, 19 years old, Gonzalez actually stabilized. He was admitted to Oak Tree Clinic, which was a medium security ward where he was treated with antipsychotics. However, immediately after discharge, he discontinued his medications and reverted to prior behaviors. Yep, that's what they do. He assaulted police officers, damaged property, and served a short stint in jail. Between his time in Oak Tree Clinic and the first instance of murder, he received sporadic care and numerous misdiagnoses? Is that? Yeah, I think that's right. Is that right? I don't know why that sounds weird. It looks like misdiagnoses. (laughs) It does. Misdiagnoses. Um, All right. Anyway, sorry. In Gonzalez's charts, a number of psychiatrists questioned the veracity of his symptoms thinking instead that he may be faking. And we will put a pin in that right there. We will definitely be coming back to that. Yeah. But don't put a pin on the chair. But don't put a pin on a chair, especially your classmate's chair. That is not nice. I was going to make a joke about that until it started getting more serious. Because I was like, that's not that bad. Oh, yeah, no, he should have probably been expelled. <laughs> I remember someone in uh, grade school that used to do that in our classroom. That's a terrible thing to do. I could never do something like that. Spencer probably did that. No. I was a good kid. That's right. You were, you're still a good kid. <laughs> All right. Where was I? Some of his psychiatrists thought that he could be faking, but it was said that he did have schizophrenia as well as antisocial personality disorder. So he's faking both of those things? No. I. Well, like I said, he had... A, numerous misdiagnoses i just looked it up misdiagnoses <laughs> misdiagnoses yes. thank you he had numerous misdiagnoses so i think some because it seemed like he had a whole team of people working yeah, on him yeah. some people thought he was faking others diagnosed him with schizophrenia and antisocial personality disorder so i was kind of being sarcastic because like i feel like at this point it's pretty clear that this guy's had issues he but- has Yes, he definitely at this point has issues and wow. um we'll yeah. get into um we'll get back put a pin in that. Yeah, put a pin in that. So people have stated that Gonzalez himself said that he was inspired by horror films and related most to Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street fame, whom we all know, and that Gonzalez wished to emulate his violence. He also considered Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, the Columbine killers, to be role models and wished to execute a similar crime. His mother had actually written dozens of letters and made phone calls to Health and Social Services and the House of Commons. She was repeatedly ignored. She pled with her member of parliament And on June 22nd, 1998, she wrote a letter to the director of Surrey Social Services asking whether her son, quote, must commit murder before being given any assistance with his mental health issues. Go mom. In an interview with The Independent, which I'm assuming is a local paper, uh, Gonzalez's mother was quoted as saying, quote, 
Every time we ask for help for Daniel or Daniel did himself, we were told we would have to wait for our crisis to occur before he could get the help he needed. That is so fucked up. Which it's is- really insanely fucked up. And a common response. And to this day, yeah. and I mean, this is in taking place in um, London, England. Yeah. Um, but this is a huge issue in the yeah. U.S. today. Absolutely. And we just watched Joker. It was my third time last night. And we, Spencer and I, had a big discussion afterwards just about how the movie, it just makes um, a really valid statement on the uh, the way mental health issues are treated. I mean, not only in our country, but around the world and yeah. just people are completely ignored and not taking seriously, which leads to violence and murder. And it's just. We could do a whole episode on that. Totally. But, but this um, this story right here, I just think, is is something that is still very, very relevant, even though this took place almost 15, 16 years this ago. Was, well, in 1998, well, granted, yeah, uh, that was over 20 years ago. Yeah. Shut up. But the, the murders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. The uh, murders themselves. Yeah. You know, 16 years ago. But anyways, back back to the story of Daniel Gonzalez. Um, so basically, every time they asked for help, even Daniel himself asking for help, they were repeatedly ignored. On October 26, 2003, Gonzalo, Gon, eh, Gonzalez himself wrote to his doctor stating that he wasn't coping well, he felt suicidal and paranoid. The doctor suggested that Gonzalez go to the hospital. However, no treatment occurred. In 2003 and 2004, various doctors had concluded that Gonzalez posed, quote, very little risk either to himself or others. In fact, shortly before the first murder, one doctor stated that Gonzalez was, quote, doing very well without medication. Whoa. Over the weekend of September 11th and 12th, 2004, Gonzalez attended a rave in Hackney where he partook in self-described massive amounts of speed, molly, cocaine, and ketamine. Wow. Then on Monday, September 13th, 2004, two days before the killing spree, Gonzalez was seen sprinting around the family's property nude. When his mother arrived home, she found that the kitchen was littered with kitchen knives. On September 15th, just mere hours prior to committing his first murder, Gonzalez left what was up until that point the only sign of physical violence. He used the first murder weapon, a kitchen knife, to stab a sink in his home, which left a small dent. Hmm. So now we get on to the actual murders. That same day, Gonzalez traveled 30 miles to the isolated coastal area of Ports Creek, a place popular with walkers and runners near Halsea Station, Portsmouth. 61-year-old Peter King and his wife were walking their dog when Gonzalez declared to the man that he was going to kill him. Though he suffered multiple stab wounds to the chin and a minor slashing wound to the throat, King was able to fend off Gonzalez, who muttered, Sorry, I'm a schizophrenic. I can't help it. And then ran away. Oh, my God. Beginning shortly before this attack, then continuing amidst his killing spree, Gonzalez actually wrote letters to himself using an established nickname, Zippy. He gave himself pointers and wrote of his plans, hopes, and dreams. At one point, he wrote that this murderous undertaking was, quote, one of the best things I've done in my life. In another letter to himself, Gonzalez concluded that he had failed to kill King because the knife that he had wielded was too short, which led him to shoplift a pair of long knives from a department store the next day on September 16th. But he's doing great off medication. Absolutely. Not a threat. Not a threat to himself or others. After the attempted murder of Peter King, Gonzalez traveled approximately 30 miles to Hove, another seaside town. He wore a hockey mask like Jason Voorhees of Friday the 13th fame and hidden some bushes. He jumped out and killed 73-year-old Marie Harding by stabbing her in the back, then slashed her throat. She had walked a remote path through a wooded area near Oakton Crescent, East Sussex. 
For 10 hours, beginning late on the night of the 16th, Gonzalez drank in a West End pub. So now we're adding alcohol to to the situation. Uh, yeah. 10 hours of drinking. And then in the early morning of September 17th, he traveled nearly 60 miles to Tottenham, north of London. At 5.30 that morning, he attacked 46-year-old Kevin Malloy in the street. Malloy, an Irishman and former pub landlord who had been described as a gentle giant, was stabbed multiple times in the face, neck, chest, and abdomen and died on the pavement. At 7 a.m. in Hornsey, four miles from the scene of the Malloy attack, Gonzalez forced his way into the home of 59-year-old Kumis Constantino and his wife, Cristela. They were awakened by a noise and saw Gonzalez coming from their kitchen with one of their own knives, which had been an eight-inch blade. The husband, who despite having been stabbed numerous times in the forearms and chest, was able to fend off Gonzalez by using a baby cradle. No way. I hope the baby wasn't in it. I I hope the baby wasn't in it. And I, I, I don't think there was a baby in it. He was stabbed how many times? I just said multiple times, oh, numerous times. And in the, still, that's awesome. Yes. Um, so Gonzalez lost that knife in the struggle, and Cristela ran into the street yelling for help. There was no mention that she had been harmed. So that is good at least. Wow. All right. So now after the attack on the Constantinos, Gonzalez, now covered in blood, was not only able to take a cab to Highgate, but was also able to buy another knife. Awesome. Not sure who would sell someone covered in blood a fucking knife. Or what cabbie would be like, I'm sorry, is that blood all over you? Uh, I'm not taking you anywhere. But now, beginning at approximately 8 a.m., Gonzalez attempted frantically to enter a number of random homes in the area. Eventually in Highgate, he gained entry to the home of 76-year-old Derek Robinson, a retired physician for the underprivileged, and his wife, Jean, who was a 68-year-old retiree who had a career with Christian Aid, which is a UK charity fighting global global poverty and injustice. Mm -hmm. So two people who are doing amazing work to help other people Mm. have a tragic end to their lives. He killed them both by stabbing them to death and committed his most brutal crimes. After the fact, according to police, Gonzalez called the experience, quote, orgasmic. A local decorator and a neighbor of the Robinsons saw Gonzalez inside the Robinsons' home, nude, covered in blood, and phoned the police. Only a few hours after the last attack, Gonzalez was finally arrested in the subway. All right, so now we are going to go on to the capture and trial of Daniel Gonzalez. Yeah. After his arrest, Gonzalez was held at Broadmoor, which was a high-security hospital where one doctor suggested that Gonzalez was the sickest patient in residence. While at Broadmoor, he was in full escort and always accompanied by custody officers wearing full riot gear. Wow. Gonzalez engaged in continuous self in injurious behavior in the form of attempting to rip out his own veins with his teeth. Ew. Oh, God. At his arraignment, Gonzalez claimed insanity, which was rejected. Prosecutor Richard Horwell contended that Gonzalez was a psychopath, that it was, quote, his very personality which led to the murders. On March 16th, 2006, the jury denied the defense's argument that Gonzalez suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. Had the jury accepted this argument, Gonzalez would have been granted diminished culpability and would have been found guilty of manslaughter. On every one of the six charges, two attempted murders and four murders, Gonzalez received a verdict of guilty. Judge Anne Goddard ruled that Gonzalez would receive the mandatory life sentence, one for each of the attacks. He would be remanded to Broadmoor or a similar institution, acknowledging that he was psychiatrically ill, but that did not preclude him from knowing right from wrong. For a period of several months at Broadmoor, Gonzalez was considered to be so serious a case that he was kept in the intensive care unit. Wow. 
On August 9th, 2007, at 8.30 a.m., Gonzalez was found dead in his Broadmoor cell. He committed suicide by using the jagged edge of a CD jewel case to cut his wrist. Oh, jeez. So this is a... Uh, quite a tragic story for everyone around because clearly this person needed help he needed psychiatric help he needed medication his mother pleaded for him to have help and even said does he have to murder someone before he gets the help he needs he wanted help these murders these four murders and these two attacks could have totally been prevented if people did their jobs. And so at the bottom of the article on the criminal code site, there's an option to leave a reply. Hmm. Only one reply to the article is left, and I want to read it now. Okay. So this is from an anonymous person, but I'm assuming it was from one of Daniel Gonzalez's close acquaintances. Okay. This was written on March 22nd, 2019. Oh. Daniel was a very well-known person with many friends. In 1999, a group of 30 teens all lived together in an abandoned building. They all knew him as Zippy. Most of the group had nicknames and knew he had serious mental health issues. Witnessing him talking back to his voices or dribbling when he had been taking his meds. However, they all looked after him and he looked after them. He was very well known in both Woking and the London rave scenes. Zippy was taking medication that made him normal. He stopped taking it after a few of his friends took his medication and it turned them crazy. One was sectioned for a few days claiming to see, in his words, low flying aircrafts trying to attack. Everyone was talking about what it did to those who took it, making each other paranoid so they wouldn't be tempted to take it. Being kids, not thinking about how that would affect someone who actually was paranoid, after this, he did become paranoid about what the medication did, and he started to come off his medication. Weekends we spent in London at illegal raves. Weekdays causing havoc in the local town just being careless teens, who had either been kicked out of or run away from home. The teens had come from all types of backgrounds. Many had drug and alcohol issues just starting. Zippy had a few girlfriends, but by 2002, the teens had grown up, got jobs, or had families and moved on. This is when Zippy started to become lonely. He started spending more time on his computer, and his mental health started to get worse again. Everyone who knows him feels shocked by his actions, but they knew how many struggles he had with his doctors or his medication along with his mental health. We all knew he was very unwell, but we didn't know Daniel the serial killer. We knew Zippy, the Psytrance loving, always laughing party boy. It makes us feel sad knowing he heard voices and was not helped enough, even when he asked for it himself. We don't agree with his actions at all, but understood how it got so bad without the correct help. His story has so many layers, and he is still misunderstood. He was failed many times, and everyone who knew him feels awful for his victims and the families. If anything else, we hope no one else is failed in this way again. What he did showed the monster that was buried inside, but he wasn't always bad. He was not a loner who had no life or friends. He cried when he met our children and hugged us to try and make us smile when we felt down. He had spent many a time in and out of the Abraham Kali unit in Chertsey Hospital, a unit for patients who needed to be sectioned. It's not been very well documented, hence so many flaws and not enough action taken to help. His case is horrific for what he has done and how it should have been prevented. He went from being on trial as a sane man who was never sane to begin with to being classed as one of Broadmoor's sickest patients. This in itself shows how misunderstood and let down he was. What he did was very, very wrong and he won't be forgiven for that ever. The families of his victims are having to suffer for failed attempts to get him help. So that 
was a letter written anonymously by one of his acquaintances. And I just think it's completely heartbreaking to know that so much pain and suffering and loss could have been prevented if we just took mental illness much more seriously. Honestly, like, I'm curious, and I don't know if maybe you read anything about this, but at the trial when the judge basically was like, you know, you're going to go down for this. Did they mention the fact that, like, he, do you know if, like, his his attorney or whatever, like, mentioned the fact that, like, hey, we've been trying to get this help and prevent this, and he's even, like, that's so appalling to me. I Because they basically were like, yeah, we're not going to help you, and then now we're going to punish you for life because you are crazy and you asked for help, but, oh, well, you killed people. I mean, yeah, I don't really know much about that other than the defense's argument was that he did suffer from paranoid schizophrenia. Um, So they did know that he had mental health issues, whether or not the his doctors received any sort of punishment for not doing their job and for ignoring the problem and telling telling him he was faking and saying that he was not a harm to himself or other people i don't know if any of his doctors lost their licenses or received any sort of fines or if they're still practicing or whatever but probably not i would guess but <sighs> honestly if i was one of the family members of the, like one of the victims i would sue the fuck out of the cops well if i was daniel gonzalez's mother i would sue yeah. the fuck not Wait, why would you sue the cops? I would sue the doctors. Well, and the doctors, yeah. But didn't he, Did uh, maybe I misunderstood, but didn't he call the police or was it his doctor he called? Oh, he called his doctor to say he wasn't doing well. Yeah, let me find that. Well, it was, so his mother called Health and Social Services and also yeah. the House of Commons, which I'm not yeah. sure what that is, like what a similar thing in the U.S. would be. But she did contact social services, they did reach out to the doctors. So, I mean, it sounds like his mother tried to do everything she could on her part yeah. to help him. And that he understood himself that if he didn't get the help he needed, he might do something. Which is so heartbreaking even more because I can't even imagine being in that kind of state mentally and then, like, going out and doing those things and knowing that you're doing those things, but also having no power to stop it. Like, that's just, oh, my God. It's horrifying all the way around. Yeah. It's a very sad story. So what So he, what about, like, just killing people with knives is what he well took as inspiration from Freddy? I think um, they discussed that he spent a lot of time watching horror movies, that Freddy Krueger was his favorite of the horror movie characters that he would watch and that it said that he wished to emulate the violence. So yeah, Mm. I'm assuming the fact that he chose knives is his weapon of choice. That was his way of emulating Freddy Krueger. Other than that, like I said, it's very loosely based on, you know, the fact that he's called the Nightmare on Elm Street killer, Mm. I think is more... um, Tongue in cheek or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's a stretch. It's a stretch. They they wanted to give him a moniker, yeah. I think, to make him more famous than he is. Or uh, I don't. I don't. I don't really know. You're absolutely right, though. I mean, it's total bullshit that not just in this country, but apparently everywhere, like mental illness is still not something that's taken seriously. Like I know I have friends who suffer from depression and like have trouble with their employers if like they need to stay home, you know, because they're just having a bad day or whatever. Like people don't view it as being like, oh, just suck it up or whatever. And mm-hmm. you suck it up. Like, oh, my God. I'm like literally speechless because I'm just like very angry. But that, thank you for sharing that. I have not, I did not hear that story. And that's like so sad on many levels. And people need to hear that story, I feel like. Yeah. And now for the first time ever, I think mental illness is starting to become more accepted as yeah. it's okay to feel this way. It's okay to to be this way. And 
it's okay to go to a therapist and it's okay to be on medication to if that's what you need to to help you cope with everyday life because everyday life is it, life is just really hard in general totally. especially if you deal with mental health issues and I just really hope that um it just be continue it continues to become uh, more widely accepted and more uh, discussed in mainstream society and in movies and TV. And I really want you to watch Joker and I want to know your thoughts on that because I think it does a very good job dealing with those issues. And I understand the controversy surrounding the film. I don't agree with it because I don't think the issue is the film can lead to violence. Mm. I think the issue is why is there so much violence? Yeah. And what can we do to prevent that? Yeah. I'm, I'm like seriously probably going to rent it later tonight and watch it. And you know, Joaquin Phoenix isn't that bad either. (laughs) He's so good in this. If he doesn't, if he doesn't win best actor, I'm going to be very upset which is tomorrow at the time of recording. And so by the time this episode is airing, uh, the Oscars will already be over. So you all already know the answer. (laughs) Wow. Hey. I I was thinking that as I said that. Hello from the past. (laughs) Congratulations, Joaquin Phoenix, on winning uh, Best Actor for Joker. I hate award shows, but I do hope that happens. (laughs) Sharon's calling it now. I'm calling it now. I don't even know who's nominated, really. But... He deserves it because he's awesome. I don't remember who else is nominated other than Antonio Banderas because we watched his movie Pain and Glory yesterday, yep. which also, uh, that doesn't really deal with, uh, it deals a little with mental health issues for sure, drug drug addiction. Um, yeah, it was yeah. a good movie, although I would not say, I, I wouldn't have even nominated him for Best Actor. It was a good performance, but nothing outstanding. Yeah. Antonio, we love you. You're oh, great. Yeah. But- Joaquin is going to take this over you. Sorry. I hope so. But Desperado, baby. All the way. He, he's he's a really great actor. He is. He's very good. Uh, on a more serious note related just to mental health, um, obviously, you know, if you suffer from mental health in any way, there are a lot of places you can go to get that help. And we strongly urge that you do. Um, and specifically, if you have thoughts of suicide, please call 1-800-273-8255. That's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Thank you, Spencer. Yes. Yes. And all right. So that was kind of... um, So on that note... (laughs) On that note, that was a little bit of a downer. Um, Do we have anything... Do we have anything we want to close on to maybe like lighten the mood a bit? Um. I had a thought for a future episode this week and then was like, yeah, no. But I realized that I really enjoy watching House Hunters International and yelling (laughs) at the stupid Americans that ask for stupid shit, like, while they're in Europe looking for homes. And I was, like, in my apartment by myself yelling at my TV and swearing earlier this week and then was like, okay, you're officially a crazy old lady, Melinda. Stop. Crazy old but, cat lady, because your cat was sitting next to you. <laughs> no, he went in the other room. He was like, "Fuck this, she's yelling again." He was like, "Bitch, you're crazy." But I know we we need to. I, we had talked about maybe live commenting on like some Lifetime movies or something. Maybe <laughs> we need to do that to kind of lighten the mood or something. Mm, yeah, I think I we know. need to do a uh, top ten list of the best worst Lifetime movies. Oh, yes. I think we need to start. Um, writing things down and binging binging that and it could be for our listeners it could be like a we watch this you don't have to but you can laugh with us Mm -hmm. kind of thing and and what about guilty pleasures obviously that's not really related to your sort of creepy podcast thing but oh yeah i watch i i don't ever stop watching kindred spirits which is it's a it's like a reality paranormal show but um two the two people on it were from the original ghost hunters uh, shows with TAPS, the uh, the Atlantic Paranormal Society that like started off all of these reality paranormal shows back in the day. Um, and Amy and Adam, who are on Kindred Spirits, are really awesome people. And I just want to hang out with them and be friends. But I watched the shit out of that show and I love it. I'm rewatching all of 
Schitt's Creek before I watch <gasps> the final season because I fucking love that show. And every once in a while, I'll just be like walking around my house and I'll bust out. I'm a little bit la 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 la, a little bit of Lexus. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! She's so amazing. It's probably the funniest scene of any TV show I've ever seen, <sighs> and that made her my like favorite character. We might have to post like a, a <laughs> link to like the YouTube video yeah, or something yeah, yeah. because even without knowing what the show's about, like you could go in cold and still like. Uh, she is so good at playing that character. They're all so good at playing their characters. And if you've never seen this show, uh, it gets better and better yeah. every. At least it started off great, but mm-hmm. each season is better than the previous season in like all ways. It's amazing. It's so good. It's scary how good it is. <laughs> but Catherine, Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy are like the ultimate dream team and have been like for pretty much ever so in daniel levy i'm and, like oh i yeah. have such a crush on him now he's just so talented and amazing and i've been watching all these interviews with like the whole like the four of them and they're just all four of them together like amazing i i kind of hope they go on to do other things together because i'm gonna cry my eyes out when Shit's Creek ends and I would love to see them go on and make some movies together in the the whole you know waiting for Guffman best in show type yeah. type films that they were making I think um Annie Murphy and Daniel Levy need to become a part of that whole they would fit right in for sure yeah and on another happy note, I, Bob's Burgers is back very soon. Yay! So <laughs> that's my happy place show. It's it's not a guilty pleasure. I proudly talk about it. That it's like one of my favorite make me happy shows. So, oh, all right. Well, I feel better now. <laughs> so, Mindy's homework assignment is to watch Joker tonight and report back to us. I can't wait. Oh my god! And I think I'm gonna go home and watch more Shit's Creek. And Spencer, what are you going to do? Edit this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. All right. We're well, clearly party people. <laughs> it's winter in Chicago. Nobody cares. <laughs> Everybody just wants to hide under a blanket. Hibernate until yeah. March. Good job this week, guys. Yay us. Con- c- yay us, considering I'm still recovering from the flu. Spencer's recovering from a foot crushing injury and mindy's just recovering recovering from life (laughs) yeah we're all a little tired and low energy so thanks for sticking with us but uh uh we will be back uh soon soon with new episodes otherwise this show is over (laughs) so we have to be thank you once again for listening please find and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you can find us Horse Talk Horror pretty easily. We love hearing from our listeners, so please feel free to uh, send us in your ghost stories or suggestions for stuff to watch, movies, TV shows, whatever, um, anything that you might be interested in hearing us talk about. We love that stuff. Um, or just to say hi. Um, we really love doing this this podcast, and we'd like to keep doing it. And one way to help us do that would be it would be awesome if we could get some reviews written on like iTunes or whatever your platform of choice is just because that helps you know push us up in the in the rankings and and keeps us going um but we are very very grateful that y'all come and turn tune into us every week or whenever we decide to post an episode I guess you can also if you're not a social person you can also email us horse talk horror at gmail.com I think I just Co- ran right over and covered that, everything yeah one sounds full swoop. good i think you cover the whole gamut sweet so all we got left to say is thanks, thanks for, for getting, getting creepy, creepy with us, us. sharon do you want a beer uh, oh my god